Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, as always, and today I'm joined by Dr. Gordon Gallup. He's professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Albany. He is best known for developing the mirror test, also called the mirror self-recognition test. He also studied tonic immobility or animal hypnosis. His later work on animal behavior focused on ethological approaches to the study of animal behavior under laboratory conditions. And since the 90s, he has researched human evolutionary psychology exclusively. And those are the topics that we're going to cover today. So Dr. Gallup, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it, Ricardo. Okay, great. So let's start with these. I mean, I've already talked about this issue on my channel with several different people, evolutionary psychologists mostly, but uh, what about the evolution of orgasm? Do we know where in, the, in our evolutionary history, and I mean, I'm also including other species orgasm started? Is it that there are other uh, sexually reproducing species that also experience orgasm? Do we know anything about that? I, th I think we do. I think there's growing evidence to suggest that uh, the capacity to experience an orgasm mm -hmm. is in fact a byproduct of evolution. And byproduct. orgasm, byproduct of evolution. Mm -hmm. And orgasms evolved to uh, promote the reoccurrence of sexual behavior in species that have low reproductive rates. And, and, and to illustrate that, let's take uh, species differences in the frequency of sexual behavior. Sexual behavior can range from having sex once in a lifetime to having sex multiple times during a single day. And at the extreme, in the case of sex that only occurs once in a lifetime, you have what are called uh, Pacific salmon. <clears throat> and when Pacific salmon uh, make the migratory run back up the stream where they were originally conceived, after the male and female pair off and, and the female deposits her eggs and the male inseminates those eggs, both participants die. Sex in Pacific salmon triggers physiological mechanisms that lead to the demise of the parents. So the opportunity to reproduce in the case of, of salmon is a once in a lifetime event. And if you only have once in a lifetime to reproduce, you can't afford to miss that. So you would expect salmon to be highly motivated to spawn. And if salmon encounter obstacles in, in the stream when they make the migratory run back up like a hydroelectric dam that's been erected in the interim, they'll literally jump out of the water and smash themselves repeatedly into this obstruction in a futile attempt to complete the spawning act. So salmon are highly motivated to spawn. But when they spawn, I would argue that neither of the participants realize any gratification or sexual pleasure whatsoever, that it's a hedonically neutral act, that orgasm only evolved to promote the reoccurrence of sex in species with low reproductive rates, salmon, you know, on one occasion have the potential to, to produce thousands, tens of thousands of descendants, most of which will perish. But nonetheless, a single reproductive act has a huge potential. Whereas in the case of mammals, which in many instances only produce a very few uh, offspring uh, on, a, on, 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 on any particular reproductive occasion, in order to maximize their fitness, they need to do it more than once. And humans represent the extreme case, 
where humans only only typically produce one offspring at a time. And the inner birth interval for humans under natural conditions is estimated to be about three years. So uh, humans, a human female who becomes reproductively viable at 15 years of age is probably only going to be reproductively viable for about 20 years, 15 to 35. Um, and if she has one offspring every three years, over 20 years, that's about seven plus or minus seven offspring in a lifetime. And in during most of human evolutionary history, the infant death rate was about uh, three to one. For every three children that you'd produce, only one would survive. So the typical human female uh, during most of human evolutionary history had a very limited reproductive rate. The other problem that, that's fairly unique to humans that has been solved in other species is synchronizing insemination with ovulation. Sex, when it comes to reproduction, won't suffice because of the fact that sperm, in many instances, have a very limited lifespan. Yeah. Therefore, in order for reproduction to occur, insemination and ovulation have to be synchronized with one another in time, plus or minus about 12 hours, is the case of humans. Most species have solved this problem through patterns of seasonal breeding, cyclical breeding, and ovulatory signals. Humans, however, no longer show pronounced patterns of seasonal breeding or pronounced patterns of cyclical breeding and human females no longer produce vivid, easily discernible ovulatory cues. So the only way to solve that problem of synchronizing insemination with ovulation in the case of humans is to engage in high frequency sex. High frequency sex is an all algorithm that will solve that problem. If you have sex on a high frequency basis, eventually there'll be a, an occasion in which insemination and ovulation are closely coupled together in time and that will produce conception. So you might expect humans to anchor the, the, the upper end of this sexual pleasure or sexual gratification dimension. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, could we say that orgasm serves some important evolutionary functions? Well, in addition to promoting the reoccurrence of sex and species that mm -hmm. have low reproductive rates, yeah. the effect of orgasm uh, is very different in males and females. Even though males and females experience orgasms in pretty much the same way, yeah. the consequences of orgasms are very different. Females experience orgasms in ways that suggest that orgasms function to promote good mate choices. Mm -hmm. The available evidence shows that when females uh, engage in infidelity, yeah. there's been, there, have been, there have been anonymous surveys conducted of a fairly substantial number of human females who, have, who admit to, under the cloak of anonymity, have, of having cheated or engaged in infidelity. And when they do engage in infidelity, they typically uh, have sex during the fertile phase of their menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. They refrain from using contraceptives and they're more likely to experience an orgasm. So although many females might claim that the reason they cheat is because they're sexually bored, the evidence suggests quite to the contrary that unbeknown to them, when they cheat, they're doing so because of mechanisms that are operating below the radar that evolved to promote good mate choices. 
and the timing of the orgasm, uh, I mean, the timing of the encounter, mm -hmm. uh, the behavior during the encounter, namely refraining from using uh, contraceptives, and the experience of an orgasm all converge to make conception more likely. There's growing evidence to suggest that female orgasm produces vaginal and uterine contractions that are conducive to the movement of sperm up through the female reproductive tract so as to increase the likelihood of conception as a consequence. Mm -hmm. So orgasm also has, at least in females, the sort of mechanistic function of increasing the probability of uh, conception. Correct. So that females uh, unwittingly experience orgasms because orgasms promote good mate choices. So if a female has sex with a number of males and only experiences an orgasm with one of those males, mm -hmm it's the male she experiences an orgasm with that is most likely to achieve paternity. Mm -hmm. And females have, have, a, have a number of, there are a number of advantages that accrue to females who engage in uh, what are called extra pair copulations or, mm -hmm. or engage in selective infidelity. One is that it enables females who are in an existing pair bond to uh, have a child that's sired by a male that has better genes than her resident male partner. It also enables females to increase the range of variability among their existing offspring, so that if the environment should change, there's a greater likelihood that w at least one or more of her offspring will show the kinds of underlying genetic differences that may match that environmental change. Mm -hmm. uh, and are there any particular for, well, reasons? Well, for example, let me, excuse me, Ricardo, yeah, but let, no let, me, let me just elaborate a little bit more on that. Mm -hmm. Sure. By the, by the time a female has had three children who have all been sired by the same male, she will have sampled about 87.5% of her resident partner's genes. And any further children sired by the resident male will be increasingly redundant samples. And it's interesting to note, by the time females have had three children sired by their partner, they're more likely to engage in extra pair copulations. And this has the effect of increasing the range of genetic variations among her uh, existing children. Mm -hmm. So when females or women in this case uh, have sex with multiple partners, so let's say that they have semen from multiple partners inside of them. Uh, if they have an orgasm with one of them, but not with the others, the semen of that man, uh, I mean, the probability of it uh, encountering the egg and uh, for conception to begin increases. Well, if a, if a female has sex in with two or more males in sufficiently close proximity to one another, yeah. that satisfies the conditions that are, that are associated with what's called sperm competition. Mm -hmm. So that the, that, the, that the sperm of one male are now literally pitted against yeah. the sperm of, a, of another male. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of adaptations that evolved adaptations that have occurred to uh, enable resident males to counter the presence of rival male semen in the female reproductive tract. Mm -hmm. and, and sperm competition is one. So that uh, if males sus suspect that their committed partner has been inseminated by another male, there are adjustments in the number of sperm Mm -hmm. in the ejaculate 
So if males watch pornographic videos of the same female having sex with different males and masturbate, if you change the, the, the female that's in the video, mm -hmm. uh, have a new female, there'll be a resurgence of sperm in the next ejaculation. So a change in partners increases the, the density and number of sperm in the ejaculate. So, so, so there, are, there, are, there, are, there are mechanisms operating at the level of the testicles that appear to take into account the context in which the ejaculation occurs. The other feature that appears to have evolved to uh, minimize the chances of the resident male being cuckolded by a rival male under conditions in which a female is inseminated by uh, two or more males is that the configuration and morphology of the human penis appears to have evolved to scoop out and displace rival male semen from the female reproductive tract, mm -hmm. which then enables the resident male to substitute his semen for those of his rivals. And this is what's called the semen displacement properties of the human semen, of the human penis, I'm sorry. And we've done a lot of work on that, attempting to simulate sexual encounters under laboratory conditions using uh, artificial genitalia and, and uh, artificial sperm. Mm -hmm. So these changes that occur uh, in the semen, uh, uh, so th 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 do they also happen when, for, when, for example, uh, the female that is partnered with a particular male is, stays away for a while, I mean, apart from the male, and then comes back because that would be, let's say, a window that she could use to have sex with other males, right? Exactly. A period of separation uh, raises the prospect of, because males won't be able to monitor or guard mm -hmm or sequester their, their committed partners. If there's a period of separation, that raises the prospect of uh, female infidelity. And that produces adju adjustments, not only in terms of sperm count when they re reunite, but it yeah. produces changes in how males engage in penal thrusting. And they thrust in ways that are deeper and more vigorous. And that's consistent with laboratory findings that we've uh, We've, we've developed, which show that deep, vigorous thrusting is more effective when it comes to semen displacement than uh, shallow thrusting. Mm -hmm. and, and the magnitude of, there are two things about orgasm that are, that are particularly interesting. Okay. Most people that study orgasm look at, at uh, orgasm frequency. Mm -hmm. The other interesting but neglected dimension of orgasm is orgasm intensity. I mean, there can be, uh, there can be uh, 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 mediocre orgasms, there can be good orgasms, or there can be orgasms that, that are exceptional. Mm -hmm. And intense orgasms are associated with with greater sperm count. Mm -hmm. So the difference between a, a, a mediocre orgasm and intense orgasm for males is a reflection of, of sperm recruitment mechanisms that operate to tailor the ejaculation to the context in which it occurs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, and what about the differences in how men and women uh, are able to experience the orgasms in terms of their number because women are able to have to experience multiple orgasms consecutively, but men usually don't. Correct. Um, one answer to that is that <clears throat> ejaculations are expensive metabolically expensive, mm -hmm. whereas 
orgasms are metabolically cheap. And once a male has ejaculated, uh, it takes roughly two days in order for the quality of the ejaculate to return to the pre-ejaculation uh, level. The, 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 the best chances of conception occur under conditions in which the latency to a, between one ejaculation and the next is two days or longer. Anything shorter than two days uh, di diminishes the likelihood of conception as a result. So females, by having multiple orgasms, may be engaging in behaviors that further increase the likelihood of conception by a particular high quality male. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand. So uh, another question, when we were talking about, uh, I mean, the several different mechanisms that men have at their disposal when there are different uh, copulatory moments with different men to try to displace the semen and to have some intracopulatory advantage in inseminating the woman, the particular woman. Uh, right. Is that due to paternity uncertainty that men evolved those mechanisms? Precisely. That yeah. males and females uh, are very different in three ways. Uh, they're very different in terms of genetic assurance. Females have an ironclad guarantee of sharing 50% of their genes in common with each of their children. Mm -hmm. Males, however, run the risk of being cuckolded. Yeah. The, the probability of sharing genes in common with their, with their ostensible child is always less than one because of the ever-present possibility of female infidelity. Mm -hmm. Another big difference between males and females is that females uh, invest far more in offspring than do males, pater paternal investment. Uh, Females are the ones that get pregnant, females are the ones that, that engage in breastfeeding, and females are the ones that are usually the primary uh, caretakers. The other, the other, the third big difference between males and females, in the case of many sexually reproducing species, particularly mammals, is that males have a much greater potential for reproduction than do females. Males produce uh, uh, enough sperm in a lifetime to father 500 times the number of people who ever live, whereas a female only releases one egg at a time. And once conception occurs for a female, she can't conceive again for about three years. Once conception occurs, the onset of preg pregnancy produces hormonal changes that inhibit the release of eggs. And then following conception, breastfeeding, which was the only option for most of human evolutionary history, produces what's called lactational anovulation and inhibits the release of eggs. So females not only have a very limited capacity to reproduce, but females, uh, pay the lion's share of all of the costs when it comes to reproduction. So females can ill afford to make many reproductive mistakes. Females don't have many degrees of option or many degrees of freedom. So females evolve so as to put a premium on make choice. Females have, because they have to invest so much, time and resources, females have a very strong vested interest in the other 50% of the genes being carried by each of their offspring. And females that made judicious mate choices had their genes better represented in subsequent generations than females who were indifferent to the other 50% of their genes. So, so females when it comes to sex, sex 
is there, there's no such thing as Dutch treat when it comes to sex for females. <laughs> <laughs> females are the ones that that pay the freight and and pick up the pick up the tab. Mm -hmm. So so males evolved in ways that promote opportunistic sex with lots of different partners to maximize their fitness. Females evolved to make judicious mate choices. So females evolved to, make, to be discriminant maters. Males evolved to be opportunistic maters, which puts the, the reproductive best interests of males and females you know, out of phase with one another when it comes to uh, maximizing their fitness. Mm -hmm. And these behavioral differences between men and women also manifest at other levels, like, for example, mate guarding, infidelity. I mean, it is, it is not the case that men and women guard their mates for the same reasons and they are also not, uh, they don't go with infidelity, let's say, for the same reasons, correct? Precisely. Um, there have been studies conducted in which they have uh, people that are in committed relationships yeah. agree to imagine that their partner is having sex with somebody else and then uh, and or agree to imagine their partner is falling in love with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And what they discover under those conditions is that when males are asked to imagine their partner having sex with somebody else, they get very upset. Mm -hmm. Females don't get as, a, as a upset as males do under those conditions. But when they're asked to imagine their, that their partner's uh, falling in love with someone else, mm -hmm. females are far more concerned and far more upset than are males. And the reason for these differences is that males run the risk of being cuckolded yeah. under conditions in which their partners have sex with other people. Mm -hmm. Females can't be cuckolded, but females can be abandoned. Mm -hmm. and, and females that were abandoned by uh, a, 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 a strong, uh, high quality, protective, male during evolutionary history would have been in dire straits mm -hmm. right so 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 you can view males as as attempting to promote paternal confidence and you can view females as attempting to minimize abandonment by their committed partners females not only have a vested interest in the genes of their committed partner, but they have a vested interest in a partner who will make a long-term commitment to the female and her child by way of protection and provisioning. Mm -hmm. And by entering into a committed relationship with a, with a protective, committed male partner, this also then gives females the opportunity to couple their mates. Mm -hmm. So apart from these uh, behaviors that men have to guard their mates and to increase their paternal certainty, let's say. Um, are there any other ways, I mean, for example, cues that men might be attentive to uh, in terms of the children that, that basically were produced by their partners? I mean, is, is there, are there some cues like, for example, facial cues and other types of physical cues that men could pay attention to, to uh, be more certain that a particular child is really their son or daughter? That's absolutely correct. We've, we've done considerable research which shows that uh, shared physical features, mm -hmm. uh, are not only a phenotypic indicator of shared genes, but males are very sensitive to the presence or absence of shared facial features and invest far more 
in infants that they share features in common with than infants that they don't. So paternal, assur paternal assurance is uh, driven in many instances by uh, paternal similarity or shared physical features. Yeah, there's even those anecdotes where people say that uh, maternal grandparents usually focus on the resemblance of the child to their parent and I mean they complement the parent if they like their daughter's partner and say something like oh she or he really looks like yourself <laughs> right what grandparents do interestingly enough is <clears throat> In case of, of grandparents with, with children derived from both the son and the daughter, mm -hmm. they spend much more time and invest far more resources yeah. in their daughter's children than they do their sons. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this, from an evolutionary perspective, mm -hmm. is that they have a better chance of sharing genes in common with their daughter's children than they do their sons because their son's children may not be their son's children because paternity is the weak link in the evolutionary scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask you another couple of questions about intercourse and is semen because you also done very interesting work on the potential antidepressant properties of semen. So does it have any or not? Well, it turns out that <laughs> an ejaculate mm -hmm. consists of both sperm and uh, seminal fluid. And you, if you extract, and, and the sperm only, only only make up about 5% of an ejaculate. Mm -hmm. And if you take out the sperm, what you're left with is what's called seminal plasma. It's the equivalent of taking out the red and white blood cells from human, from human blood. And mm -hmm. that gives you blood plasma. And seminal plasma is a very complicated concoction of a variety of different chemicals, hormones and, and uh, 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 immunosuppressants and uh, neurotransmitters and uh, 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 all kinds of other things. And the available evidence suggests that the composition of seminal plasma mm -hmm. evolved to manipulate and commandeer the female reproductive system. That that seminal plasma is designed to convert the female reproductive system into a user-friendly environment for human sperm. The vagina, uh, and this seems counterintuitive, but the vagina is a hostile environment for human sperm. And the reason it's a hostile environment for human sperm is that females can ill afford to get pregnant by any Tom, Dick, or, or Harry. The principal means by which females maximize their fitness is through making judicious mate choices. Yeah. And, with, and, and, and the, the vagina, the chemistry of the vagina is one in which there, it contains high degrees of acidity which would be absolutely lethal to sperm. But within a few seconds of ejaculation, seminal plasma converts this acidic environment into one that's more alkaline and therefore more user-friendly for sperm. The female's reproductive tract treats sperm as pathogens, that they're, they, 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 are, they are foreign proteins, mm -hmm. and females often show what's called a spermicidal immune reaction. But with repeated insemination over an extended period of time, 
the female's reproductive tract begins to tolerate the semen of a particular male. And human semen contains uh, immunosuppressants, which, which suppress this immune reaction on the part of the female. And that's what uh, is conducive, therefore, to eventual conception as a result. And by through, through seminal priming, repeated insemination of the same female by the resident male, this not only leads to a situation in which the female reproductive tract tolerates the male semen, but when she gets pregnant, the infant represents a pathogen as well because it's, it's, it, it only shares half of its genes with its mother and the other half of the genes with its father. And there are reasons to believe that semen tolerance may then generalize to the chemistry of the fetus and reduce the likelihood of, uh, of morning sickness as a consequence. We think morning sickness is a reaction to uh, the fetus as a pathogen. Mm -hmm. But uh, does semen have any particular psychological effects on the women or not? Um, well, that, there, there, there's, there's, there's growing ev evidence that it does. And let me use uh, uh, a couple of examples to illustrate the potential psychoactive properties of semen. And to do that, let, let me talk just briefly about kissing. Mm -hmm. Kissing appears to function as, a, uh, as an evolved uh, courtship mechanism. Mm -hmm. And at the moment of a kiss, there's a very uh, rich exchange of chemical and postural and olfactory information between the two people who are engaging in a kiss. And We've discovered that the majority of males and females have found themselves at, 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 at one or other or several points in their past under conditions in which someone they thought they were attracted to, when they kiss them for the first time, they discover that they're no longer interested. So we think that at the moment of a first kiss, there are unconscious mechanisms that decipher and analyze these intimate cues, chemical and olfactory cues, in ways that allow the participants to assess the health, the fertility, and the genetic compatibility of their potential partner. And if it's not a good match, then the first kiss can, can, can undermine the future of that relationship. We think that the same thing may be true of semen sampling. Mm -hmm. Courtship not only involved uh, a, a mechanisms, hardwired mechanisms that assess mate quality uh, through, say, kissing, for example, but Courtship may have evolved semen sampling, that is in the process of, of courting and, and being courted by different males, semen, females may have been inseminated by different, different males. And there may be mechanisms operating at the level of the female vagina that, that, that decode and assess the chemistry of the semen to make a determination about whether uh, that's a good genetic match. So women would either, after being inseminated by a man, they wake up the next morning and they, they're either head over heels in love or they wake up the next morning with feelings of regret about what they did the night before. The other aspect of semen that has generated a lot of interest is that there's some evidence that semen may contain antidepressant properties. And uh, as a consequence, uh, that may uh, 
serve to reinforce and promote the development of a committed relationship between the male and the female so that the female now uh, uses uh, insemination by her partner to modulate her mood. And the evidence shows that females who have unprotected sex uh, are less likely to show evidence for uh, depression than females who are either having protected sex or females that aren't having sex at all. And we've uh, we received a number of uh, of unsolicited uh, semen testimonials from females about the uh, psychoactive properties of, of semen. And let me just read you one anonymous account that we received. This is one of, of several yeah. that we received from a, a female. Dear Dr. Gallup, I find your research on semen very interesting and life-changing. I'm a graduate counseling psychology student at such and such a university. I was driven to study the field of psychology after my own battle with severe PMS. I went to doctor after doctor for nearly 15 years before I came across your research linking semen and depression. My husband and I used condoms for 20 years and just recently stopped. We've been experimenting and I've noticed that when we have unprotected sex five to six days before my period, I have absolutely no PMS symptoms. During fertile days, we use condoms, but my husband, husband saves his semen for me and I rub it on my body. The more sex we have the week before my period, the better I feel. I no longer take an antidepressant, bad news for the drug companies, but great news for my wallet. Plus, my husband loves it. I feel like I lost almost 20 years of my life because I suffered from horrific PMS symptoms. We've gotten similar semen testimonials from women uh, who have been in a committed relationship with men and are having unprotected sex and their partner uh, opts for uh, uh, a vasectomy. And following vasectomies, women, some of these women report uh, increased depression, suggesting that one of the consequences of being vasectomized may be that it changes semen chemistry. It not only eliminates the sperm from the ejaculate, but it may have hormonal consequences as well. Mm -hmm. Th that's really interesting. So could it be the case that uh, the recent rise that we've been seeing, particularly in the West, uh, of people that uh, experience periods of depression or even chronic depression, uh, particularly in women in this case, uh, could, could, uh, could the use of condoms have something to do with it? We've, well, let me give you an example. <laughs> <laughs> We've done a number of surveys of, of, of females yeah. uh, based on, on whether they're sexually active and if so, whether they're using condoms or not. Mm -hmm. And for females that are in committed relationships where they're having unprotected sex and are being exposed to semen on a regular basis, if the relationship terminates, they are far more devastated by the termination of that relationship than are females who are, have been in a relationship in which they've been using condoms. Mm. And interestingly enough, the, the likelihood of a rebound effect following the termination of a sexual relationship varies as a function of whether the females were being inseminated or not in their former relationship. Those that were being inseminated in their former relationship begin having sex with other males much sooner after their initial relationship terminates than do females who were using condoms. So the risk of the rebound effect appears to vary as a function of the presence or absence of insemination. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. What about the other, the other property of semen that 
has come to light recently is that semen may have sedative like properties. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason the, the presence of sedative like properties may, may be important is that humans, during the course of human evolutionary history, the distinguishing feature. Of, of humans is the assumption of an upright posture. That represents the split between humans and other great apes. And the assumption of an upright posture puts the human reproductive track into a, per, into a perpendicular orientation with gravity. For most mammals, the female reproductive track is in a parallel orientation with gravity. But with the assumption of an upright posture, that puts the human female reproductive tract in a perpendicular orientation with gravity where it's poorly suited for sperm retention. Mm -hmm. And there have been a number of adaptations that have occurred during human evolutionary history that appear to have been driven by this problem of sperm retention. Humans, when they engage in sex, the most common means of posturing is uh, for the female to be in a prone position on her mat, on her back, and the man to be on top. This is what's called the missionary position. And this brings the female reproductive tract back into a more primitive parallel orientation with gravity. And you would expect, therefore, mechanisms to evolve to, to minimize resuming an upright posture after being inseminated. And indeed, <laughs> the sedative effects of orgasm and the sedative effects of semen may be conducive to keeping the female in a prone position on her back for a prolonged period of time so as to maximize the likelihood of conception as a consequence. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's so getting the, yeah. the, 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 the popular phrase that people use to capture uh, having sex, which mm -hmm. is getting laid, maps onto, appears to map up, map onto uh, an, an evolved feature that uh, put a premium on uh, sperm retention in a creature that otherwise uh, has a reproductive tract in the case of females that's positioned perpendicular to gravity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about another topic now. You've okay. also done work on self-recognition. So let's talk about that and also about self-awareness. How do we study self-recognition in humans and other species? Well, self-recognition occurs at, at several levels. Um, one of the most interesting ways to think about self-recognition is at a, at a biochemical level. And autoimmune reactions like arthritis represent a failure to show self-recognition. So the immune system begins to attack other parts of the body as if they were pathogens. So isn't that an interesting way to put self-recognition in perspective? It, it occurs at a biochemical level. Mm -hmm. But self-recognition can also occur at a, at, a, at a more advanced, more complex, more cognitive level in terms of being able to become the object of your own attention. Mm -hmm. And that's how I define self-recognition, the capacity to become the object of your own attention. And one way to achieve that situation is to confront an organism with its reflection in a mirror. Mm -hmm. When you see yourself in a mirror, whether you realize it or not, you become the object of your own attention. Unlike humans, most animals that are confronted with themselves in mirrors act as though they were seeing another animal and fail to decipher the dualism that's otherwise inherent in mirrors. There are only three species that have shown clear, unequivocal, reproducible 
experimental evidence for mirror self-recognition. And those are chimpanzees, orangutans, and humans. And the way we uh, developed a test for mirror self-recognition was to uh, anesthetize chimpanzees with prior exposure, exposure to mirrors and then superimpose on their faces a bright red uh, alcohol soluble non-irritating odorless dye on the top portion of an eyebrow ridge and the top of the opposite ear. Mm -hmm. After they recovered from anesthesia, they were then uh, uh, fed and watered, and the mirror was then brought back into the room for the first time. And when they see themselves in the mirror with these strange red marks on their faces, they reach up and attempt to touch and inspect those marks. Chimpanzees without prior exposure to mirrors, however, who are anesthetized in marks, fail to identify and localize the source of those strange red marks on their faces. And this is what's come to be called the mark test of self-recognition. And there are only three species that have consistently passed under rigorous experimental conditions the mark test. And that's humans, chimpanzees, and orangutans. There have been claims made for uh, cetaceans for dolphins, uh, for elephants, and for a variety of other creatures. But to date, either those claims haven't been replicated or they involve a single subject. Mm -hmm. So, and it's interesting that it's only us, chimpanzees, and orangutans, because we have at least two other species that are closer to us than orangutans, in this case, gorillas and bonobo. So would there be any explanation as to why bonobos and gorillas lack self-recognition? That's a good question. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that bonobos, like common chimpanzees, uh, in fact, some people refer to bonobos as pygmy chimpanzees, that bonobos recognize themselves in mirrors and that the, the difference between bonobos and common chimpanzees is a, is a strain difference, like the difference between different breeds of dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, gorillas, however, uh, appear to be the odd man out. Um, yeah. There have been many attempts to demonstrate self-recognition in, in gorillas and the uh, vast majority of those attempts have failed to find uh, compelling evidence for mere self-recognition. There are one or two exceptions, but the exceptions uh, typically involve a single gorilla and uh, attempts to replicate self-recognition and other gorillas have not proven very fruitful. So it's entirely possible that during human evolutionary history, uh, gorillas, lost the capacity to recognize themselves in mirrors. The available evidence suggests that humans and chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas are all descended from a single common ancestor. Mm -hmm. And therefore, maybe that common ancestor was self-aware. And gorillas used to be self-aware, but they lost the capacity to recognize themselves in mirrors because gorillas no longer compete among one another for, uh, for fitness maximization. Mm -hmm. That's and, very and one of the very interesting things about being able to recognize yourself in a mirror is that it puts you in the position of being able to use your experience to make inferences once you realize that it's you that you're looking at when you see yourself in a mirror, it puts you in a position to use your experience to then make inferences about comparable experiences in others. So when you see someone in a situation that's similar to one that you encountered in the past, you all obviously assume that their experience is gonna be similar to your own. And while it's true that no two people have exactly the same experiences because you and I are members of the same species, we share 
similar receptors and similar neurological features in common. So there's bound to be some overlap between your experience and my experience. So not only can I begin to use my experience to infer features of your experience, but given a knowledge of my own mental states, I'm in a position to now make inferences about your mental states. And that's what's called mental state attribution. Mm -hmm. So as a byproduct of self-awareness, we're in a position to begin to use a variety of increasingly sophisticated social psychological strategies to compete among one another for scarce resources in the interpersonal domain involving uh, making inferences about what other people may know, want, or intend to do. And all of the available evidence to date suggests that this capacity is an extremely limited capacity when it comes to uh, other animals. Mm -hmm. That most other animals not only fail to recognize themselves in mirrors, but most other animals fail to take into account what other animals may know, want, or intend to do. And let me illustrate this with, the, with an sure. example using what's what I call the porcupine uh, metaphor. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you have a dog and your dog uh, returns from the woods after a run in the woods following an encounter with a porcupine and it's got porcupine quills embedded in its nose and its face. Mm -hmm. With a concern for your dog's well-being, you can either take your dog to a veterinarian and have the veterinarian remove those quills, or you could get a pair of pliers and attempt to remove those quills yourself. If you were to opt for the latter, it would probably prove to be an excruciating ordeal because as you remove those barbed quills from your dog's face and witness your dog's reaction, it would prove almost impossible not to empathize with what you assume to be going on inside your dog's head. You would generalize from your prior experiences with pain to your dog's ostensible painful experience. It doesn't require that you've ever been prior, you've ever been quilled, but only that you've had prior experience with pain. Mm -hmm. Now the question then becomes one of <clears throat> how would another unrelated dog witnessing that transaction respond? And any veterinarian can tell you that dogs are oblivious to pain and suffering in other dogs. So dogs probably experience pain in much the same way you and I do, but dogs can't use their experience of pain to infer painful experiences in other creatures. Not even in humans. Not even in humans. And what dogs may learn to do is respond to, to subtle cues from humans mm -hmm. that makes it look as if they're making inferences about what other people may know, want, or intend to do. Yeah. But, but, I, but I've concluded that many species may have clever brains but blank minds, blank minds in the sense that they can't use their experience to make inferences about experiences in other creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the relationship between self-recognition and self-awareness? That's a great question. Self-recognition, in the case of humans, human infants emerges between about 18 and 24 months of age. By 24 months of age, 65% plus or minus of human infants uh, pass the mark test. Mm -hmm. With the emergence of the ability to recognize yourself in, mirror, in a mirror, there's the corresponding emergence of self-awareness. And you can begin to use your experience to then begin to make inferences about experiences in others. But 
self-awareness, once it emerges, emerges, becomes increasingly more sophisticated with time. Just as mental state attribution, once it emerges, becomes increasingly more sophisticated with time. And one of the gold standards for mental state attribution is involves <clears throat> uh, taking a, a box that of that 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 used to contain crayons and filling the box with uh, m ms and you then show it show the box to a child and ask them what's in the box and they'll say crayons and you then open the box to reveal to the child that rather than containing crayons it contains m ms you then ask the child what another child will say about what's in the box prior to about three years of age the child will say that other children will say that there are crayons in the box now, after three years of age they say other child will other other children will say that there are crayons in the box but prior to three years of age they say that the other child will say that there are m ms in the box so it's only after about three years of age that children reach the point where they can appreciate the fact that false beliefs may exist in other people. Other people may believe things that are contrary to what they know not to be true. And this then fine tunes their own self-awareness to take into account that not everybody may perceive the world in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And the so self-awareness, self just like mental state attribution, once it appears with self-recognition, may undergo a series of, of changes and become increasingly more sophisticated over the human, the trajectory of the human lifespan. Mm -hmm. Do we have any evidence of self-awareness in other species? I mean, we've already talked about self-recognition, but what about self-awareness? <laughs> The jury's still out on whether self-awareness exists in other species. Mm -hmm. uh, one way to test that, there, well, there's several ways to test that. One is to give uh, uh, individuals uh, experience with visual obstruction. So if you give a chimpanzee experience with blindfolds, how would it respond to another chimpanzee wearing blindfold, wearing a blindfold? Would it use its prior experience with blindfolds to take into account the other chimpanzee's inability to see mm -hmm. and therefore engage in behaviors that it wouldn't ordinarily engage in if the other chimpanzee could see? Same thing would be true in the auditory domain. If you were to, to teach a baboon, for example, to vocalize every time you enter the room and you give it a and you give it a reward you give it an m m or a, or a peanut every time it vocalizes when you enter the room if you then gave the baboon experience with auditory obstructions like headphones mm -hmm. if you then entered the entered the room wearing headphones on the next day would the baboon adjust the intensity of its auditory emissions to take into account your impaired inability to hear? Mm -hmm. Could it use ex its experience, in other words, to <clears throat> make inferences about your ability to either see or hear or whatnot? Mm -hmm. And there are, uh, there are a number of studies in which people have claimed that uh, chimpanzees are capable of engaging in mental state attribution. And there are other studies that claim that chimpanzees uh, fail to reach that point. So the jury is still out. But it's clearly the case with humans that self-recognition is a precursor to mental state attribution. There are no instances of mental state attribution in the absence of self-recognition. Mm -hmm. 
And what about minds? Be uh, to talk about a more general, uh, let's say, psychological uh, phenomenon, I guess. Uh, do other, can we say that other animals have minds? Well, I would define self-awareness as the ability to recognize yourself in a mirror. I would define consciousness yeah. as being aware of your own existence. Mm -hmm. And I would define mind as the ability to make, to use your experience to make inferences about experiences and your experience with your own mental states to make inferences about mental states in others. Mm -hmm. And let me give you some examples of mindlessness. Mm -hmm. Schizophrenics <laughs> mm -hmm. will frequently initiate conversations as if you'd been privileged to their prior thoughts. And humans occasionally do this. Someone may, may come up to you out of the clear blue and say, what do you think we ought to do about it? And you'll say, do about what? Or they'll come up to you and say, gee, that really makes me mad. And you say, what makes you mad? These are momentary lapses in the ability to take into account what your companion knows or doesn't know so as to carry on a meaningful conversation. Schizophrenics routinely act as if people were aware of what they were thinking and therefore began uh, conversations in, the, in, mid, in midstream. So I would call that mindless behavior. That's, that's what I would call a mindless conversation when somebody acts as if you know what they're thinking and begins a sentence in midstream. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's so, talk about... So in that, sense, in, in that sense, there may be, again, to return to the point I made previously, there may be, there may be lots of species with clever brains, mm -hmm. but blank minds. And, and the famous quote from Descartes, I think, therefore I am, if I'm correct, would have to be rewritten to read, I am therefore I think. It's the capacity to conceive of myself in the first place that makes thinking possible. And so this may be a capacity that is extremely limited biologically uh, to maybe a few great apes and humans. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, another topic now, what is tonic immobility, and does it serve any specific functions? Tonic immobility is otherwise, has otherwise been known as animal hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you take an animal, and like a chicken, yeah. and hold it down on a flat surface, its initial response will be to struggle and try to escape, but if you hold firmly, those attempts to escape will subside and it will go into what seems like a catatonic-like state. So you can remove your hands and the animal will remain motionless. And this is what's been called animal hypnosis. We prefer the term tonic immobility, not only because it's more descriptive, but because it may not be the case that the animal was actually, ha has actually been hypnotized. In fact, there's good evidence to suggest that, that, that that's not the case. And the available evidence, and there's a growing amount of evidence to support this, suggests that tonic immobility may have evolved as a anti-predator strategy that many prey species in response to potential predation go through a series of distant dependent 
anti-predator responses. So when a predator is detected at a distance, many prey species will freeze to minimize detection based on movement cues. But if the predator then begins to approach the individual, the next most frequent response is to attempt to escape, mm -hmm. attempt to flee, and if the distance between the predator and the prey continues to diminish, in spite of these attempts to flee, and contact is made, then there's fighting and resistance at close quarters. But if the contact is prolonged, the prey species then goes into this peculiar state of tonic immobility. And the classic case of a, of a, of a cat that's captured a mouse. Having captured the mouse, many cats will put the mouse down, back up, crouch, and wait for the mouse to move again. And as soon as the mouse moves, moves they'll jump on the mouse again. This is what's called playing cat and mouse. But as long as the mouse remains motionless, the probability of further attack is reduced. So if another mouse should come, come along or a bird should fly by and the predator's distracted, the immobile mouse may live to pass on its genes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it's very interesting. Let, let us just explore uh, one last topic here. Uh, so we've been talking about lots of things related to humans and our revolutionary history. So what do you think are the implications that these might have for things like religion? I think there's growing evidence that <clears throat> different religions mm -hmm. represent different fitness maximization strategies hmm. that all religions or most religions have something to say about sex. Yeah. Most religions have something to say about infidelity. They have something to say about masturbation. They have something to say about birth control. They have something to say about divorce, etc., etc., etc. And embedded in these religious doctrines are fitness maximization strategies. And let's just take Catholicism as a case in point. Yeah. According to Catholic doctrine, attempts to practice birth control are prohibited. Mm -hmm. And that's conducive to fitness maximization. Yeah. Divorce is prohibited. Masturbation is prohibited. And all of these converge to make offspring production a high probability among devout Catholics. And the same thing applies to other religions. Not in exactly the same way, but they all have things to say about sex and divorce and and uh, and uh, infidelity and so on and so forth. So religion evolved as a fitness maximization strategy that operates below the radar, so to speak, as do most fitness maximization strategies operate below the radar. Females that cheat on their husbands don't realize why they're cheating. They think it's due to being bored when their behavior suggests that it's due to an attempt to enhance their fitness by having sex with a high, higher quality male and increasing the range of genetic variation among their descendants. Mm -hmm. There's a classic study uh, by, uh, by Miller of uh, lap dancers yeah, yeah, you're you know, referring to Geoffrey Miller, right? Geoffrey Miller, exactly. In which they had the lap dancers at various bars in Albuquerque agree to keep track of their of their tips on a daily basis. 
and they and they uh, <coughs> had the lap dancers indicate whether they were using uh, birth control hormonal contraceptives or not and where they were in their menstrual cycles on any given day and after about three or four months when they analyzed the tips that they were making they discovered that naturally cycling lap dancers made about 80 percent more money when they were in the fertile phase of their menstrual cycles than they were then when they were in non-fertile phases lap dancers that were taking hormonal contraceptives failed to show any cycle dependent changes in tip making and made fewer tips at all points in their menstrual cycles than did the fertile uh, lap dancers. The lap dancers themselves, however, although they were acutely aware of day-to-day -day variation in their tips, had, had, had no insight and no awareness whatsoever of the fact that when they were in the fertile phase of their menstrual cycles, they made more tips, or when they were menstruating, they made fewer tips, or when they were on birth control, they made fewer tips than when they were naturally cycling. So these effects were operating below the radar, even though they made a, made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And people can use those data to uh, develop strategies to improve their chances of getting better jobs. So if you're going to be, if you're a female and you're going to be interviewed by a male, and you know in advance when that's going to happen. And if you can schedule that for a, fer a, a fertile phase of your menstrual cycle, you'll make a probably a better impression than if you schedule it for a non-fertile phase of your menstrual cycle. On the other hand, if you're going to be interviewed by a female, it might be more prudent to schedule the interview for a non-fertile phase of your menstrual cycle so you won't be seen as competition by the other female. And it's a classic example of how things are operating below the radar that you're otherwise not aware of, but once you can become aware of, you can use those to your own advantage. Mm -hmm. So just one last question that I have. We talked a little bit about religion. In terms of understanding human culture and the different cultural phenomena that we find in human societies, we really have to uh, include an evolutionary approach, right? Because otherwise we don't understand that well why some things are evolutionarily successful and others not. Well, I think evolution can, can enlarge our understanding of human behavior. It, it doesn't mean that human behavior isn't subject to culture and social mm -hmm. uh, influences and the effect of early experience. Mm -hmm. But in many instances, an evolutionary perspective enables you to ask questions about human behavior that otherwise would never have been entertained in the absence of an evolutionary perspective. And the, the, the thing that makes evolutionary theory interesting is that it can be used to generate testable predictions. It's not a matter of armchair speculation. Mm -hmm. You can generate scientifically respectable testable predictions. And that's what science is all about. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Gallup, let's end on that note. Would you like to mention some places on the internet where people can find you and your work, if any, of course? Well, the people are, are certainly welcome to contact me if they want to copies of reprints or papers. Uh, my email address is gallup at albany, A-L-B-A-N-Y dot, E-D-U, and I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, make those, uh, those, those reprints and uh, uh, available and uh, en even engage in uh, uh, some correspondence about 
some of these issues if you find them uh, sufficiently interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will include that in the description box of this interview. And Dr. Gallup, again, it was a real pleasure to have you on the show and thank you for taking the time. It was a real fun conversation. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. And you're, uh, you're, you're a very sophisticated, very intelligent, and very perceptive interviewer. So the pleasure was all mine. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel almost three years ago, and I re would really like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page or PayPal. Uh, because I need your support and any amount starting from one dollar uh, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perarga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kinty, Zurtger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Newburger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windager, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormer, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Thiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Staten T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adesa Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, and Tom Roth. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardus France, and Niruban Balachandran. And my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie and James Pratt. Thank you for all.